This fanless mini PC has four two and a half gig ethernet ports and it has a low power eight core processor with ginormous generational improvements. And with the new releases of Proxmox VE, PFSense and OPNSense, it makes a surprisingly good virtualization host and router that's very fast and very low power. With that, let's get to it. Hey guys, this is Patrick from STH and this is the brand new fanless N305 system. If you saw our recent B-Link EQ12 Pro video, you know I'm super excited about the Intel Core i3 N305 processor. This is the first time in almost 10 years that we have gotten an upgrade in core counts from four cores to eight cores in this low power e-core design. That means we get a ton more performance. Now, one of the challenges when we ran the N100 and N200 versions of these is that the newest Proxmox version as well as the new PFSense version were not out yet. Now that Proxmox VE8 and PFSense 2.7 are out, the Intel i226 NICs are supported as well as the new processor. Now the N305 version costs about $300, $310. So it's about 90 to $100 more than the four core version, but you get twice the core count. There are also a number of little small tweaks that were made, especially in the CWK version that I think is worth taking a look at. And we're gonna look at those in this review. And before we get too far, I just wanna say thank you to all the STH YouTube members who already support the channel and help us buy things like these so we can bring them to you for review. If you wanna help us out, that'd be super appreciated. You can find that join link down below. With that, let's get to the hardware. Okay, starting with the front of the system, you're gonna see that we have a power button. Okay, whatever. Then we have our little G button. I mean, still no idea what this thing does. There's also a little clear CMOS hole if you wanna do that. And then what you're gonna see is there are two USB ports. Now, these say USB and you see the USB super speed logo, but these things turn out that they're actually like USB two, I think, ports. We at least couldn't get these connected at USB three speeds. There's also a TF, which is like a micro SD card slot if you don't wanna pay the licensing fees for that. And then there are also two Wi-Fi antenna just kind of holes. So if you do wanna put a Wi-Fi card in, you can put an antenna on. And that is certainly not the most exciting side because what you really wanna see is the other side where we have the big features. First off, we have our four, two and a half gig ethernet Intel i226V ports. Now the Intel i226V is the newer, lower power version of Intel's two and a half gig ethernet controller, which replaced really the Intel i225V and the B3 stepping of that. So this is the newer NIC situation. And at this point, most operating systems have adopted the drivers to be able to handle these out of the box. Now we also get a HDMI port and display port. Both of these can handle 4K60 displays. And that's kind of cool because something that differentiates this, which is like an Alder Lake N series processor versus some of the other processors that you see kind of make these firewall boxes, especially like the higher end ones that have like a, you know, C3000 or C3000. 5,000 chip is that this has an integrated GPU because it's an Alder Lake generation part. Now, other features on this, of course, are the two USB type A ports. And again, we also found that these were only USB two ports. So that, that's kind of a bummer. I really think either all of these should be USB three or we should have USB two and USB three here. I mean, it's 2023 for goodness sake. The other feature we have is our grounding point as well as our DC 12 volt input. The nice thing about DC 12 volt is it's very easy to go find adapters and stuff. So if you wanna power it, not using the adapter that was provided with this, you can. And as a quick note, you're gonna see that we actually have two of these units on set because we got the CWWK as well as the Topton units. We tried getting the Topton unit, which is over here because we thought, well, that one had a different case on AliExpress, but then we found out that uh, that other case didn't ship. And so we got this exact same case. One of the things though that we got, and we'll show you in the power consumption section, is that we did get a little bit different configuration, including the power adapter for the Topton unit. So since we ended up with the same case, let's take a look at that real quick. This is a fairly decently heavy, decent sized just kind of case. And I do think that unlike the N100 version of this with only four cores, because this is a higher TDP and also just an eight core part, I do think that I like the larger case on this. I think it's a good idea. I wouldn't get a smaller case than what you're seeing here with this chip, especially if it's passively cooled. One other nice feature that we started to see in this generation is that on this bottom lid, we not only have the vent holes, so if you wanna put like a fan or something like that, you could, but there's also this nice little mesh. Now I mentioned previously that we got a CWWK as well as a Topton unit, and they are almost identical. I think CWWK makes both of them. However, the CWWK one came with some kind of interesting stuff, and I'll give you an example. It came with this like little tiny screwdriver. Hopefully you can see this. And you just kind of pop the top and inside you have the little 
little bits. So if you want to go service the system, you have a little screwdriver to do that. It's a nice little touch. With that though, let's get inside the system. Okay, now opening these systems up, you can see some things that are standard as well as some that are added by the reseller. Standard in these, we get a single DDR5 SO DIMM slot. Now I know a lot of folks are gonna say, hey, I wish this had two, and I, I frankly agree with you. I wish that this had two SO DIMM slots, but these processors, the Alder Lake N series, they are only single DDR5 channel memory. Now there are definitely pluses and minuses to that, but let me explain why I think it's actually a little bit better here. So because we have a single DDR5 DIMM in this one, we get another like 50% or so memory bandwidth, even though we have a single DIMM, we did an entire piece on DDR5 that you can check out if you want. But in a system like this, one of the most important things is lowering the power consumption. And by only having one SO DIMM in here, you can't have two, and therefore you lower the amount of power, but also the amount of heat that's generated on the bottom side of this chassis. Again, let me be clear. I really wish that Intel just made this a dual channel system so you could go put two DIMMs in there. I think that would be much better, but they didn't. And so that's just kind of what it is. You get single channel memory. Now below that as standard, you get an M.2 slot for your SSD, your boot SSD, and you also get a Wi-Fi slot. So if you wanna have Wi-Fi, yeah, you can totally have that as well. But since I think that these are like virtualization firewall devices with like four wired connections, the assumption is that these are always gonna be wired into a network. And so maybe having Wi-Fi isn't that useful on a box like these. And so what both Topton and CWWK have is they have boards that allow you to add additional storage. And so the Topton one has the old dual M.2 solution. So you have your normal M.2 here, and then it takes the converter. So there's like an H board that goes from the Wi-Fi slot and then goes to the second M.2 slot. Of course, you're not getting like full PCI Gen 4 speeds, of course, from all that kind of stuff. But on the other hand, um, at least you could have two drives. So if you want to have like a boot drive and a data drive, or you wanted to have like maybe a mirrored setup, I guess you could do that in a system like this, maybe. But one thing to keep in mind, and we've seen this with other units with this board, is that this is not like screwed in on the side. So it's only screwed in where the Wi-Fi card is. And so you could definitely hear it like when you tap it. And that's really the older style of the H board. The CWWK one though, because they're the manufacturer of this, has something that's a little bit different. You'll see that we have our M.2 2280 SSD that's installed. This is the one that came with it. It's a five speed P8 series SSD. Frankly, I think a lot of folks are gonna want something these days that's like 256 gigs, if not 512, just because uh, the SSD pricing below one terabyte is relatively compressed these days. And so you're not really saving that much by getting 128 versus like a one terabyte. And it's always nice to just have more storage if you need it one day. And what you'll see on the system though, is that we have the newer H board with a little bit slimmer of a bridge between them. It still makes noise if you hit it, but the CWWK folks sent us something in this that I think is just a little bit different. So this is the new board and it is insane. So what you do is you plug this in and you'd put this under the main M.2 slot. So it'd go kind of like this in the system. You still have your M.2 2280 port. And so if you want to put like another NVMe drive, you could go do that in here, but then you're going to see all these little switches. And what these little switches do is that depending on how you have it configured, you can take this and have a SATA. So there's like a little SATA port up here, or you could also have a M SATA port or drive bay right there. The other thing that's kind of crazy, and I don't know what this is, but there there is a you know pad placement here on this PCB for some kind of chip. I don't know if that's like a switch chip or something that you know might be on other models, but you can definitely see it here on the PCB and it's just not populated. This is a brand new thing that CWK sent. We did not get it from Topton and it just seems like this is the new direction on kind of a higher end little H board. Hey guys, it's future me. This little M.2 expansion board we knew was a pre-production model from CWWK. And just before we were about to publish this video, we got a little package in the mail that came with the updated version of this board, which you can see here. And with it, we now have instructions that we could find on the website for what all of these little switches do. Now I have to tell you, the new one feels quite a bit heavier. And the other thing that I just noticed is that the new one has tape on the back, which is good. The old one only has just exposed pins, which is not so good. But while this is pretty cool because it allows you to use an M.2 SSD, an MSAT SSD, or just a SATA port, well, there is another option now. And this one, I think people are gonna be pretty excited. The way it works is that you stick this into the M.2 slot, and then you have this carrier board right here. And then what you do is you place your carrier board 
into this with a bunch of little pins. And if it all works, uh, you're gonna get something that looks kind of like this, where it's all put together. And now you can have up to four SSDs in one of these little systems. Now there's a clock chip here that I've never heard of, but we'll at least post the specs so you can see them. And also the page with what these switches do. But to me, this is super cool because they're actually thinking about making these into NAS units with storage and stuff. And that to me is a big expansion of the use case of these little fanless PCs. We just didn't have the board when we originally got and tested the system. And the last thing I just wanna point out on this internal overview section is that the NICs for this are on the other side of the PCB. So in some of the older generation ones, you'd see that the NICs are on this side and so they create heat in this bottom chamber. But on this one, we have the NICs on the other side so they're better able to dissipate heat. So I like the fact that this newer design is using that. Okay, with that, let's get to the performance because I know that's what you wanna see. Okay, so let's talk about the thing that I'm most excited about in this system, and that is clearly the processor. The Intel Core i3 N305 got the core branding, but it does not have P cores. Instead, it's a Alder Lake N all E core design, which means you only have eight efficient cores. The TDP on this processor is nine watts. You're gonna see that the system power when we get to power consumption is way more than that, and we'll talk about that in a sec. But the cool thing about this is that the performance is absolutely phenomenal. We're not getting like twice the performance of the N200 or anything like that, but we are getting like twice the performance of the previous gen four core models. And at first that may not sound impressive. I get it, but let me kind of give you an idea in terms of performance. These things are so fast now that they're somewhere between a Core i7 7700T and a Core i5 8500T. And so putting that into perspective, this nine watt TDP CPU is now competitive with a 35 watt Core i7 from the seventh gen Intel core generation or a Core i5 from the eighth gen. Those are commonly found in Project Tiny Mini Micro one liter PCs that are around the same price as these. The advantage of course of a platform like this is that it's one fanless and two, you get four two and a half gig ethernet built in. You also get a newer Intel UHD graphics because this is Intel Alder Lake N, not an older generation part. Now, something I do wanna point out real quick is that compared to the N100 and 200, you may say, oh, we've gone from four cores to like eight cores, so we should get twice the performance. And the answer to that is, Absolutely not. One of the big reasons is just simply the TDP of these parts does not support doubling the performance. Remember that whenever you have things like PCIe controllers, DDR5 controllers, you also have that like integrated graphics, all that kind of stuff is using power in the system. And so even though we have twice as many cores, because we are power limited, we're going to see less performance than like doubling of performance just because we have double the number of cores. Still, you know, getting 40, 50 plus percent performance performance boost I think is pretty darn good. And that also makes it like twice the performance of those previous generation boxes. So for a four port unit like this, this is more than enough to virtualize your firewall and still get great performance, like two and a half gig performance. I'll also just note real quick that if you look at a lot of firewall vendors, they're still using the Intel Atom C3000 series, which is codenamed Denverton. And this is gonna be faster than an eight core Denverton part in most cases. But that performance comes at a power cost. So let's get to power consumption next. So the top system is now running and you can see that the little power button light is on and uh, the power adapter that we got with the CWWK unit that we're using here is a Dajing unit. And this power supply came with things like FCC and CE and like some markings on there. I don't know how well real all of them are, but uh, you know, it did come with that. The way, one thing I will tell you though, is that this is a much heavier power supply than what we got with Topton. Topton, uh, we got an Ockbell one and the Ockbell one has things like, uh, you know, also is UL listed and all that kind of stuff. So a, a little bit different on the power supplies, but we're gonna use the one that came with the CWK because they're the original manufacturer of the motherboard. So we figured why not just use that one? Okay, so we're idling now in Proxmox VE8. And what you'll see is that we're somewhere in that maybe like nine to 11 watt range. It's jumping around just a little bit with all the processes that are running and we are logged into it remotely. So just to kind of give an idea, it does have one network port connected and we are logged into it and we are in the console. Now I'm gonna go push us to 100% and we're gonna see the power spike significantly. Now what you're gonna notice is that we immediately push up into that 35, 36 watt or so range. The other thing though is that the core temperatures are rising, but they're rising fairly steadily. And at about 36 seconds or so, what you'll see is that we have lost a little bit of clock speed. That loss in clock speed means that we've gone down to like 28 to 29 watts of power consumption from like 35, 36. 
The frequency has also decreased into that 2.6 to 2.7 gigahertz range. I will just say that we have run this thing for like 24 hours, we've run it for an hour and all that kind of stuff. It will get hot. And when we had an issue with the AC in the studio recently, it was about 80 degrees Fahrenheit in here, which is about 26 and two thirds Celsius. And what we saw is that like, if we did this thing for an hour or two, this thing would climb into that like 75 to 79 degrees Celsius range on the core temp. So it would definitely get hot, but it didn't overheat and it was able to run the stress test for over a day. So I would say that overall, the cooling in this chassis seems to be good enough to cool the N305. And that little bit of spike that you get in the beginning that gives you that little extra bit of performance, if you're getting 30 plus seconds of a boost clock, um, you know, frankly, a lot of virtualization and firewall things, you're, you're just not gonna hit 100% utilization all the time, right? Like they're just, this is never gonna happen. And even if you do, you have a little bit of buffer there where you can get a little bit higher power consumption, but you're not gonna see, you know, you're, not, you're realistically not going to see those kind of 100% workloads on a system like this. Now, with all these videos, I like to have key lessons learned. Like, what do we learn from this? And one thing is obviously that the eight core processor is awesome. It's way faster. There is a little bit of power consumption, but it is much more competitive than it was previously. The other side to this, though, is the compatibility. These systems previously had some challenges. Like for example, the early N100 and N200 systems had compatibility challenges with things like Proxmox, where you had to like use an older version and then upgrade. But with Proxmox VE8, that has all changed because now you can either use the GUI or the text installer and install Proxmox VE8 and the system will work out of the box. That's brand new and a new functionality. It also has a newer kernel. So things just, just generally work better on that with these newer hardware platforms. Now, OPN Sense has worked for some time with the Intel i226 V Nix, but the PFSense side has always been a bit of a challenge. The community edition of PFSense has been on like 2.6 train for a while. And that frankly did not support the Intel i226V. And so you were just kind of stuck using like a beta version or a development version or something like that. Nowadays though, the PFSense 2.7 version is out and that actually supports these Intel i226V NICs. I think NetGate, the company behind PFSense actually does quite a bit of development to get these new NICs working and in FreeBSD. So shout out to them for doing that. And now you can install the community edition at least without much hassle on these. It's pretty much just you install it from USB drive. One thing I will note that was a little bit of a challenge though, was that Proxmox, when we installed it, we had this configuration right here where we had a single NIC in ETH zero when you see it like on the system. When we installed Proxmox, this is the NIC, the only NIC that we had installed. And what what happened was when we did the reboot after the initial setup and all that kind of stuff, it was unable to find the networking. Like we had an IP address, but we just couldn't find it. And what happened, which was a little bit weird, is that the IP numbering changed in Proxmox. And so we just had to change it to a different interface name, but it just sucks that these things get renamed. We didn't troubleshoot like really why it happened, but just gonna note that it did happen. And if you do have that happen, nano ETC network interfaces, and just go change it to the right NIC there. Hey guys, I hope you like looking at this. We're gonna be looking at a lot of little systems, big systems, all kinds of cool stuff on STH. And if you did like this video, well, why don't you share it with your friends, but also give it a like, click subscribe, and turn on those notifications so you can see whenever we come out with great new videos. As always, thanks for watching. Have an awesome day.